Yes, so today's lecture as well uh, is going to be based on um, my experiences as a, as a British journalist um, in, in that region uh, in the early and mid 90s, during which time uh, I was actually based in the Baltic states for the first two and a half years, and then in Moscow, but I also spent a lot of time uh, down in the Caucasus. And so had, as well as obviously in Ukraine and in Central Asia to a lesser extent. Uh, and so I had uh, many opportunities to compare developments um, and political cultures, and uh, especially, of course, different nationalisms, since this was an era of, course, of tremendous nationalist upsurge uh, throughout the, um, the, the former Soviet Union. Um, but uh, obviously, my, and I wrote two books about this at the time, um, one on the Baltic revolutions, well, three books counting Ukraine, um, and one on the First Chechen War, which I covered from both sides of the lines, both from the Chechen side and the Russian side. In, uh, unfortunately, in the Second War, that proved to be completely impossible because uh, under Putin, the Russians had got much more organized. And so prevented journalists from coming in. Uh, but the Chechens had become much more Islamist. And if the journalists did get in, they had an unpleasant habit of killing them. So, um, uh, I, and I'd also become older by the Second War and had a child. So I didn't make assiduous efforts to cover the Second War. Uh, but of course, my perceptions at the time have been filtered subsequently through um, my analysis as an academic. And I have to say, uh, I have been depressed uh, over the years um, by both by much of the journalistic coverage um, in the way that it has uh, basically created facts at the time, invented facts, and then turned those, uh, those invented facts, um, rumors really, gossip in many cases, uh, into established fact. And the way that academia has, while, uh, um, saying or hinting or believing that it despises journalism ha has in fact taken the, this journalistic gossip and also turned it into academic fact. Uh, but, um, and the result is often an extremely simplified picture of what happened. But in the area of academia, I thought I'd, I'd begin uh, with a warning against Theory, simplification through theory, or simple theorization, or whatever way you want to put it. Uh, and um, especially, uh, I wanted to warn you all against this word parsimonious. Parsimonious theory has become, apparently, in certain academic circles, a term of praise. Um, Parsimonious in ordinary English, I don't know how widely it's used anymore, uh, used to mean, or does still mean, um, uh, tight, what Americans call a tightwad, mean in the old Amer English, not American sense, somebody who's very tight with their money, ungenerous, um, at best austere, at worst selfish and um, self-centered, ungenerous, certainly. It, it made its way into academia by, I've never found out what particular means. And it's come to mean an, uh, an elegant, simple theory that explains everything. Now, I have to say, any theory that claims to explain everything about the overwhelming majority of human events, even actually in our own lives, let alone you know, events of state, political events, is almost certainly wrong. Um, uh, and uh, this love of, of so-called parsimonious theories uh, can be not, not merely lead to drastic misrepresentations, but it can also be very intellectually corrupting. And to give you an example, uh, when I was at King's College London, British academia, as um, some of you know, um, who are studying in British academia, uh, has this dreadful state-imposed exercise, but administered by academia itself, called, I can't remember what it, which came first, it's a bit like, you know, um, the Soviet secret police, it changed its name without changing its nature. Um, 
it, at one stage it was the uh, research, I think it's the research excellence framework and then another stage it was the RAE, the research assessment exercise. Anyway, whatever. Um, it's uh, the system by which universities submit what they take to be their best work to a government committee, but made up of academics. And on the basis of this, the government then allocates research funds to different universities. So this is, this is important stuff in academic terms. There is a lot of money involved in this, in academic terms, not in Pentagon terms, of course. Uh, and um, the University Administration of King's sent down uh, sample essays um, works to, all, to the different departments, uh, which they, and of course they had their spies within the REF, um, thought would be the, one, the, the kind of thing that would really please uh, the, the, the REF, the, the committees concerned, and get Kings more money. And as remember now, one of these was an essay on Irish nationalism. And uh, it was described, lo and behold, in the note that, and, you know, because of course there were reviews attached to it, indeed as a magnificently parsimonious theory, which summed up the origins of Irish nationalism. Uh, and this theory was solidly based on Ernest Gellner's uh, theory, which some of you may know, that nationalism was the direct result of industrialization, the un industrialization of society. And it uh, based its entire analysis of the beginnings of modern Irish nationalism on Irish industrialization. Um, Charlotte, are you Irish by origin? I'm Irish I, on yes, my I... mother's side. Yeah. Perhaps you can tell me why that is absurd in historical terms. Irish industrialization? Gave rise to Irish nationalism. I, I don't recall much Irish industrialization happening, but uh, that's just me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, when, when modern Irish nationalism originated, uh, Ireland was the, the least industrialized country anywhere in, possibly even in the whole of Europe, certainly in Western Europe. And the key event in the generation of modern Irish nationalism, uh, you know, uh, was the, the emigration to America and, of course, the Irish famine. And the Irish famine was a direct consequence, as well as British indifference, of course, and contempt for the Irish, of Ireland's lack of industrialization. Even the, the successful Irish rebellion against the British from 1916 to 1922 took place in a barely industrialized country. So it's simply wrong in historical terms. Now, the head of War Studies Department at the time was himself Irish by origin. And I went to him and I said, look, we cannot accept this. We, we, we have to reject this. We have to send it back uh, because it's simply completely untrue. You know, it's, it's a direct falsification or misunderstanding of Irish history. And he told me it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, we've, we've been told its theory is so perfect that this, this is the model we have to follow this parsimonious model. So please beware, beware deeply of uh, anyone who tells you uh, that um, you, know, you need to base your analysis on a parsimonious theory or indeed on any one theory. Because of course, one of the, the dreadful effects, um, I mean, in journalism, the dreadful effect of ideology, basically prejudice, um, is to produce these simplistic explanations of things that happen. Uh, but in academia, of course, you have deep prejudices, but you also have, of course, this dreadful com increasing compartmentalization of academia into, diff you know, into smaller and smaller disciplines and sub-disciplines. And, uh, of course, a strong tendency, at least within individual universities, uh, for each sub-discipline to be dominated by a particular theory. Because, of course, um, it's bad enough if you're told that it doesn't matter what really happened, you've got to, the, the theory has to fit. It's even worse, and then one does actually begin to approach something like the Soviet Union, though fortunately sort of compartmentalised on, uh, it, it, in terms of being told that you have to follow one single theory. And, of course, there are so many uh, professors who insist that their students and anyone who they recommend for a job follows some very narrow particular theory. Now, the truth of the matter is, I mean, A, that all the major events that I lived through, you know, e even on a 
relatively small, small national scale in the Baltic or whatever, had multiple causes. There was no single cause. Uh, and secondly, um, when I came to analyze them in academic terms, as I told my students, not one of them could be analyzed through only one theoretical prism. It was both entirely appropriate, but also necessary to rely on different theoretical approaches and disciplines in order to understand things. And um, what I think, you know, in, um, in journalism and academia, speaking of somebody who's been a, a journalist and an academia, uh, one really needs to also be aware of, of this leading to in terms of monocausal explanations is, of course, it can be a tremendous cover for what um, I am not very happy to find is now called in Western circles narratives of events or narratives of other people's behavior and of your own behavior. Um, narratives is another wonderful euphemism uh, for what we used to call prejudices, you know, prejudices about places. And um, this, of course, also plays to the same kind of general mentality that produces conspiracy theories. In other words, there is one thing that explains everything that happened. And very often, of course, this turns out to be something which is discreditable to one side or another, which allows you to discredit what happened, to cast it in terms of cynicism or greed or whatever. And um, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, for, the, um, for the first Chechen war, um, so often I found people telling me, journalists who should have known better, later academics, students, that the first Chechen war was all about oil, Russia's desire uh, to regain the oil of Chechnya, because Chechnya was one of the main oil producing areas of Russia and the Soviet Union. And of course, the point is, it had been but the oil had almost all been extracted long, long before the first Chechen war. Um, at most, this was a very, very minor thing. But often attached to this was the idea uh, that the Russian generals themselves launched this war in order that they personally, should the Russian military elite, should steal the oil. So something which is totally untrue and, by the way, was barely, you know, practically organizable. Well, after the Iraq war, which by the way, I strongly opposed, I'm not, I'm not finding excuses for the American invasion of Iraq here, but I heard so often that the American invasion of Iraq was all about, was really about America's desire to, to get its hands on Iraq's oil. And then this in turn was attached specifically to the supposed uh, greed and corruption of Cheney and his link to Halliburton and specific American elite desires to control Iraqi oil. Now, certainly uh, some desire for extra control over Middle Eastern oil probably did play a part. But as I'm sure any of you know who have studied the origins of that war, and I was in Washington at the time and in some position to you know, observe what was going on and talk to people uh, involved in that, uh, there were so many other reasons for, for the American invasion uh, and um, more important ones than oil. Uh, so beware, beware of parsimonious theories, beware of single theories, beware of monocausal explanations and uh, also beware of the prejudices and narratives that they can cover and, uh, and give, uh, give shelter to. Uh, now, in terms of understanding the uh, nationalist upsurges um, and accompanying political developments uh, in the Baltic republics of the Soviet Union, which had, of course, been independent until 1940, uh, and um, in the Caucasus, accompanying political events um, and uh, the very different, of course, outcomes in terms of violence. Um, there are several different theoretical approaches that you can use. One of them, of course, I only put that first because I'm a realist myself, is realism. Defined by uh, Hans Morgenthau, the greatest realist thinker, um, as interest expressed in terms of power. 
uh, state interest, as the classical realists say, or national interest, but of course also elite interests and regime interests. Um, and obviously you have to look in both contexts at the issue of relative power between the countries, the new countries concerned with and within those countries. Um, of course, uh, one can always draw um, on uh, studies and comparative studies uh, of ethnicity, ethnic nationalism and ethnic conflict. Uh, although I find myself very often that the um, these overarching theories of ethnic conflict, let alone conflict in general, uh, do not necessarily lead very far, um, partly because they uh, take their um, point of departure uh, from the idea that conflict is unnatural. Speaking as a historian, but also as a former war correspondent, uh, I've always found a conflict entirely natural in human history. <laughs> Here in, in Iceland, um, reading the Icelandic sagas, uh, basically every chapter um, ends with the words, uh, and so he killed him with an ax, um, including by the, by the way, a Christian missionary uh, who lost his temper with some pagans who refused to be converted. So he killed them with an ax. Uh, another one um, also exasperated in an argument um, with a, an unconvertible um, Viking a pagan actually managed to kill him with a crucifix by beating him over the head with it. Um, so uh, yeah, um, there's no need to look for elaborate theories for why people fight each other. They so often have throughout history. Um, but also once again, the, uh, the, the, mul the multiplicity of reasons why conflicts happen and also do not happen, you know, are so great that, um, it's often so it's really difficult to, to cram them into one theoretical free framework. And then in terms of the, the great overarching theories uh, of um, comparative politics, uh, it is certainly very necessary in this context to use a cultural framework um, because the fall of the Soviet Union is in certain respects uh, a tremendous rebuttal to the idea uh, of the prime, the, the structuralist or institutionalist idea uh, of the, the, su the supreme importance or predominant or dominant importance of institutions. Uh, if that were true, at least in the case of the Soviet Union, um, since the institutions, the political institutions of the Soviet Union were identical from Estonia to Tajikistan, um, and since the official state ideology is taught in all the schools and as embodied in the, uh, the ruling um, bureaucracy was of course also identical from Estonia to Tajikistan, uh, presumably the political outcome following the end of the Soviet Union should have been the same from Estonia to Tajikistan. Uh, as we all know, that was very much not the case. And inherited culture played an enormous part there. But having said that, I shall come back to this in the difference between the, the Caucasus and, uh, and the Baltic. In one particular area, but really only one of institutional theory, the impact of international institutions, or rather of two international institutions, the European Union and NATO, but above all the European Union, that really did have an effect on outcomes. But finally, and always, um, there is the point made repeatedly by historians, uh, made most pithily by Edmund Burke in his great polemic against the um, theorists of the French Revolution, the importance of circumstance. Circumstance, I'm paraphrasing Burke now, but circumstance for which for theoreticians is nothing, is in fact what gives the, 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 the shaping factor to every political development in the world. Circumstance, the, the contingent circumstances and inherited um, contingencies uh, in each particular nation or area. Uh, so, and you need to combine all these 
different elements. Um, one last thing, uh, which I think um, the end of the Soviet Union in general also demonstrates, uh, which is how very cautious you have to be about qualitative approach, uh, sorry, quantitative approaches to analysis derived from economics. Um, because I ask my students um, after they emerge often with a slightly zombie-like air from their economic classes, uh, why would you have to be very foolish to adopt a qu qualitative approach to an analysis of Pakistani political economy? And why would you have to be uh, cr either crazy or, frankly, in the past, a Pentagon propagandist uh, to base your analysis of Afghanistan on qualitative, quantitative, forgive me, analysis. The answer is, of course, that the Pakistani statistics are extremely unreliable and the Afghan ones are either totally unreliable or non-existent. So if you try to base your analysis on statistics, quantitative, you, you, are, you are going to be Total, either totally befuddled or lying. And of course, that was also true of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's interesting that uh, both the left and the right in the West believed Soviet statistics because they made the Soviet Union out to be much more successful than it was. Both wanted that. The left, because they wanted the Soviet Union to be a success story for socialist reasons. The right, because they wanted the Soviet Union to be this enormous, monstrous menace to the West. Um, actually, you know, when you visited it, admittedly, I, I only came in in the later years, um, you realize this was mostly an extremely poor country with a very underdeveloped economy, except in, of course, in the military sphere. Um, and uh, also with, um, by the end, uh, an extremely decayed armed forces. So, uh, but in the specific case of nationalism, of course, uh, the Soviet Union also um, devoted enormous efforts to covering up, to disguising, to lying about the continuity of ethnic identity and ethnic allegiance and ethnic nationalism in the Soviet Union. Although, believe me, there, and you know, my elder brother was traveled there in the, in, in the early 1970s, you really did not have to dig very far um, in the Baltic or, or, um, or the Caucasus to find out how powerful nationalism was. But it was somewhat appalling. Um, I remember uh, academic Mary McCartney, I think it was, um, who declared categorically in the early 1980s, there is no ethnic problem in the Soviet Union, period. She had simply bought the official line for her own reasons. Um, so, uh, ethnicity, Soviet Union covered it up. Religion, of course, not just covered up, but also to the maximum extent possible uh, abolished um, with some success. Though I think, though there, it's interesting to wonder about how far that was the effect of, you know, actual Soviet atheist propaganda and strategy and how far it was the result of modernization in general. And finally, kinship. Um, the Soviet state, of course, deeply hostile to kinship. I mean, in, originally in its more, of course, extreme revolutionary moments, hostile to the, the family as such, but certainly very hostile, like all totalitarian or semi-totalitarian states. Uh, to kinship networks, um, in part, both because it feared, you know, that, that kinship groups, which was very true in Chechnya and some other places, would become uh, the area of continued religion and attitudes, you know, religious and ethnic attitudes associated with the religion, because, of course, of the impermeability of kinship groups to state pressure, but also uh, because of a very well-grounded fear that kinship networks in different areas uh, would become uh, foci of corruption because they would people would cover up for their relatives and would basically organize mafias within the state. Um, and um, in the early 1980s under Andropov, when, um, first as uh, head of the KGB and then um, 
as general secretary. Uh, the KGB launched a, um, a, a huge campaign against corruption in Central Asia, cotton, and the Caucasus, food, wine, other things. Um, and what came out of that, because there were attack, they, they then, of course, sponsored and allowed attacks on it in the Soviet um, media. Uh, what came out of that was the degree to which kinship in Central Asia tribe and clan had, in fact, come to permeate the Soviet bureaucracy in many areas. And of course, after the end of the Soviet Union, uh, one saw, especially in Central Asia, um, the way in which uh, kin uh, kinship groups, in fact, came to dominate politics. They became the, the, the key element in post-Soviet state politics, based, of course, on the former Communist Party and um, the state bureaucracy and the KGB. And in Tajikistan, the civil war which occurred uh, after the end of the Soviet Union was, to, it was of course about Islam and conservative revolt, but it was also about the revolt of the excluded Tajik tribes, the ones who had been excluded from the elites under Soviet rule, the later stages of Soviet rule against the dominant tribes, it's these aspects of these politics throughout Central Asia. Um, and uh, so, of course, all, all of this was co covered up by um, Soviet uh, state, you know, the state picture of the Soviet Union, uh, but came to have a tremendous, came to have open importance uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And so, of course, uh, in several former Soviet republics, you have dynasties, you know, actual dynasties, which pass on power from father to son. Uh, and of course, uh, in, inside uh, Russia, to a certain extent, Chechnya being the great example, the Kadyrov dynasty. Um, and these factors help to account for the tremendous vari variation in political developments are, uh, uh, and, and nationalism. Uh, after the end of the Soviet Union. In terms of ethnic violence, state strength or straight state weakness or in the last resort state failure, um, and also the success or failure, or the relative success or relative failure of democratization. Um, but of course also history and circumstance, as I said. Uh, just to, to, to give you one example of um, a, a Georgian example of what went on under Soviet rule. Um, uh, uh, when I first visited Georgia, um, actually, no, not when I, that, that was on a subsequent visit, uh, a Georgian friend, because it was under Shevardnadze already, uh, had drawn up as part of his researches uh, a family tree of dominant communist and post-communist political families who under Shevardnadze of course had come back and were dominating things in the late 1990s and it was fascinating to see how they were linked by marriage jobs you know going from fathers to sons-in-law much less frequently daughters-in-law and children but there was one relationship in particular which was that of godparent, which was marked and clearly was an extremely you know, important, which it is historically and culturally in Georgia, the role of, God, of, of, of godparent to somebody else's children. And uh, I, I remarked that I, I suppose since these were all of them senior communist officials, uh, that this must have been, um, you know, uh, the, it was called being a godparent, but it didn't um, actually involve taking the baby to church and baptizing it. It was hardly likely that the um, deputy interior minister of the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic would do that. And he replied, no, they did do that. This is Georgia, not Russia. In Russia, there was a, a well accepted thing whereby parents, even you know, in the communist party, even some quite senior ones, would leave the baby at home with the grandmother and the grandmother would 
take the baby off and baptize it. But in Georgia, because of this, the impermeability of Georgian society, uh, in part because of um, old Joseph Stalin to the control from Moscow, you actually had senior communist officials turning up in church with the baby and baptizing it there. So you know, all these traditions which continued under the, the shell or armor of Soviet rule. Now, uh, when it um, comes to the, the very different political outcomes and the le different levels of violence in uh, the Baltic and the Caucasus, uh, to start with the Baltic, um, I think I mentioned uh, in a previous lecture, you, know, you seem to have in the Baltic states, um, uh, well, Estonia and, and Latvia, not Lithuania, um, all the material for really serious ethnic violence as the Soviet Union collapsed. Because, of course, under Soviet rule and as deliberate Soviet strategy, uh, I mean, you know, design, uh, designed as part of the industrialization of the areas, but with an absolutely clear goal of ethnic dilution as well, um, uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, in total millions, uh, of Russian-speaking settlers had been introduced into Latvia and Estonia to work in the great all-union factories, as they were called, uh, reducing um, the Latvian population uh, by the end of the Soviet Union to only 56% of the population of Latvia, um, and the Estonian population uh, to, I think, 63%, if I remember rightly, something like that mid-60s. Uh, and of course, this caused bitter unhappiness. Uh, there was even a Latvian, an attempt by the Latvian communist leadership under Brezhnev to push back against this, which resulted in them all being kicked out and purged um, and replaced by loyalists. Uh, and fear of ethnic swamping was a fundamental aspect of Latvian and Estonian attitudes. Lithuania less so because the Lithuanian communist leadership, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, was able to play under a man called Snechka, a much cleverer game in warding off industrialization and hence migration. Um, so you would have thought uh, all the grounds um, for ethnic conflict. And by the way, I mean, one interesting thing is that uh, as a result of this ethnic tension, uh, it, in the later years of Soviet rule, there were repeated and pretty violent riots between Bo Latvian, Estonian and Russian football teams. At, well, not between the teams, but at the matches. It was also, of course, covered up, but it was well known about uh, because of these ethnic tensions. So why did you not get in the Baltic states ethnic violence between ethnic Balts and Russians or Russian speakers as the Soviet Union collapsed, as you did in the Caucasus. And uh, just to, to give you an interesting example, um, I actually witnessed in Tallinn uh, in the spring of 1991 an attempt by the Soviet Communist Party, the KGB, whoever, obviously that wasn't clear, to stir up ethnic conflict was a classic example of its kind. I was visiting uh, this big factory, Russian workers in, in Tallinn, um, in, in, because this was um, part of the, uh, the referendum on independence, so I wanted to find out what the Russian workers there thought. Overwhelming majority were against independence, but while I was there, these Communist Party activists came round and they were handing out leaflets alleging that an American submarine had landed 15,000 automatic rifles on the coast of Estonia to arm the Estonian Popular Front, at that stage the nationalist pro-independence movement, in order to launch a rebellion and massacre, kill ethnic Russians in Estonia. And so these leaflets were being passed around. 
And so I you know, went up to different bunches of workers and I asked them what they thought about this. And the same ones who'd said they were against Estonian independence, I asked them if they believed this and they said, no, rubbish, of course, this is the KGB, up, this is the Communist Party up to its old tricks, you know. And I, and I said, but you oppose Estonian independence. They said, yes, we oppose Estonian independence, but that doesn't think, mean we think the Estonians are gonna come and massacre us. They're not like that. They never have, you know, we know the Estonians. Strange people, the Estonians, but not murderous people. And so this attempt at manipulation from above failed, this attempt to create an ethnic conflict, because the basic human, historical, cultural material was not there. But it must be said uh, also for, uh, a con well, for, for one, contingent reason, uh, perhaps, we don't know, we can't say for sure. Uh, but in the last months of the Soviet Union, leading up to the um, coup of August 91, which then led to Soviet disintegration of Baltic, well, the independence of all the republics, um, there was the beginning of an absolutely obvious KGB uh, attempt to spread, to, to stir up ethnic hatred through terrorism, state terrorism. Uh, there were several bombs in uh, Latvia, um, targeting, of course, uh, though the, 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 there were no serious casualties, I'm happy to say, uh, the, the communist offices. And so it was clearly an attempt to blame this on the Latvian nationalists, and both to justify state repression, but also to alarm and stir up uh, the Russians of the um, of Latvia. Uh, in Lithuania, it was much much worse. Um, unnamed assassins, uh, obviously KGB, killed uh, a dozen. I think it was, or maybe killed eleven and and badly wounded a twelfth. Um, Lithuanian border guards, uh, both obviously as a warning to the Lithuanian nationalists of what in the last resort the KGB was pre prepared to do, but also it seemed to all of us at the time an attempt to provoke the Lithuanian nationalists into violence. And so why was there no ethnic units you know, violence? On the part of the uh, the Balts against the Russians, well, the most important the the immediate reason was, but then you have to ask why they did this and why it worked. Unlike, alas, in Georgia or Armenia um, or Chechnya, uh, was that the Baltic national movements, uh, including their ra their more radical elements, sent out orders to all their followers, categorical orders, there must be no violence. Even those of you who've in the past, you know, rioted after football matches, this must never happen again. Because this is exactly, they said, what Moscow, the Soviet government, the KGB want. This is what they are trying to, to, to create. We must not play their game. Um, and interestingly enough, the followers listened and obeyed. Uh, of course, a total contrast with the Caucasus, alas. Um, and so, because there were, there were no attacks from one side, there was no mass response from the Russian side either. Uh, but other things have to be added in, I think. Um, one of them was that behind this, there was also the belief, which turned out to be well-founded, uh, that after independence, um, the Baltic states would be able to move towards membership of NATO and the European Union. Um, and there was also this awareness, uh, as, and of course, especially once Western diplomats started being able to visit the Baltic states, that any you know, ethnic violence would have a catastrophic effect on 
these hopes. And uh, I, I, so, sorry, I always tell my students uh, when I give lectures on this subject, these are lectures with extra anecdotes, but you know, I was there, so I might as well tell them. But it was a very interesting dinner in Lithuania I hosted um, in the winter of uh, 91, 92. Uh, four visiting British diplomats, uh, and um, I invited some Lithuanian nationalist politicians of my acquaintance. And by then, uh, it had already become apparent that it was very likely the former communists were going to win the next elections, first free elections after the fall of the Soviet Union. And the radical nationalists present, these were Landsbergis' people, sounded out the British basically about what the West would do if they, in, in effect, carried out a kind of coup, because they were in power at that stage, cancelled or suspended the next elections um, and banned the former communists from political life. And the response from the Brits was, look, you know, you are the Lithuanian government, in the last resort, it's your decision, you know, we, we, we can't stop you, but be aware, that if you do this, you will place an enormous barrier or create an enormous delay to your chances of joining the European Union and NATO. And if you don't, as they're all very well aware, which is why they were so passionate, passionately anxious to join the European Union and NATO, there is a very, very strong chance that sooner or later you will fall back under the domination, if not the direct rule, of Moscow. <coughs> Sorry. And you could see these Lithuanian nationalists basically swallow hard and say, ugh. Gulp. Ah, we better not do this. This is where institutional theory comes in. I was talking about the the fact that the Baltic states had and were told they had and believed they had a really good chance of moving rapidly towards EU and NATO membership also had a tremendous effect on shaping their policies. And this was above all true in Latvia and Estonia when it came to citizenship policies, because the original citizenship laws, which would have barred the vast majority of Russian speakers from ever getting Latvian and Estonian citizenship, would, I think, have created a, you know, a potentially explosive situation in the long run. The EU, as part of the whole acquis communautaire, was able not to change those laws completely, certainly not to satisfy the Russians, uh, who, by the way, with good reason, felt that every promise made to them, to Yeltsin, had been broken when it came to citizenship, uh, language rights, and so forth. But at the very least, they created uh, the, the European Union pressure through the U European Union accession process did create greatly modified um, rules and guaranteed to a much greater extent uh, the position of Russian speakers in the Baltic states. So what you got in the Baltic was a situation in Latvia and Estonia is a situation I think with certain analogies uh, to the situation in Malaysia. Um, not Indonesia, thank God, where things have been much more violent, but a situation where political power is monopolized by the indigenous population the Latvians, the Estonians, the Malays. It's a little bit the same in, in Fiji, but though they actually did have a military coup. Uh, but the quid pro quo is that the Russian speakers, by the way, by no means necessarily actually ethnic Russian, whatever that means, dominate the commercial economy. Uh, they dominate most of the banks, the businesses, just as the Chinese do in Malaya and the Indians do in Fiji. And that has created a working relationship, um, which has certainly been often tense, it's not a happy relationship, but it has not been a violent relationship. And But the important thing to remember here is, um, one hears it less now, but in the 1990s, you've heard it all the time, the path to 
democracy and the free market, the path, a path to a defined goal. Now, a, one of the, re the reasons, you know, for the fatuous illusions about the West, America in particular, the West in, in general, when it came to Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, so many other places, is that this is nonsense. Um, there is no one path. Look at history. There is no one path to democracy and the free market. There are multiple paths, uh, some leading to democracy, some leading to the free market, only rarely leading to both. Many, many different paths, and there is no fixed goal, as we see today. There are multiple different kinds of democracy, and there are certainly different kinds of free market. Only in one case, and only to a certain extent even then, can one speak of a path or the path to democracy and free market, and that's the European Union, because of the acquis communautaire and the accession process. You go through a fixed accession process, you have to sign up to a fixed set of rules, and then you join, you achieve a fixed goal, which is European Union membership. Then, of course, uh, if you are, if I may say so, the Poles, the Hungarians in one way, the Romanians and the Bulgarians in another, having got into the European Union, you proceed to do whatever you bloody well like. Um, so um, <laughs> it's also not a, it, it's sort of you, Jack and Jill, you get to the top of the hill and then you, or do I mean the Duke of York, whatever, um, you then go somewhere else, but you, you do get to the top of the hill first. Uh, anyway, the institutional, um, the role of international institutions in this particular case, but certainly in the Caucasus, the fact that NATO and EU membership were clearly not on offer, you know, at, in this critical period of the 90s also had this effect. Uh, but also, I'm sorry to say, uh, that in the Caucasus, all parties were much more prepared to resort to violence as the first option, or at the very least, the second option. Um, I was actually, well, in Tbilisi, and then I drove to South Ossetia um, in early December 1990. You know, another myth that's become a fact is the, the idea that the war um, over South Ossetia began in 2008. It didn't. It began in 1990. When the Southern Ossetes declared sovereignty, um, autonomous district of, uh, of Georgia. Now, clearly, with the, the hope or the intention of joining the Northern Ossetes, who are an autonomous Republic of Russia. Uh, but um, sovereignty was a very unclear and fungible uh, concept uh, at that time, or still in general. And throughout Russia, uh, you had uh, autonomous republics declaring sovereignty. Yeltsin, uh, one of the few, I think, good things that he did was that Yeltsin did not overreact to that. He basically interpreted sovereignty as enhanced autonomy within the Russian Federation. Um, uh, with the result that in the end, it was only Chechnya where you saw an actual you know, war of secession against Russia. I'm very sorry to say that the instead of saying sovereignty, of course, sovereignty within Georgia, details to be negotiated, Gamsakhurdia, the then Georgian leader, tried to send in nationalist truckloads, busloads of his nationalist activists to give them a nice name to try to crush this. Now, of course, as I practically wept in telling the Georgian government at the time, please, please, this is exactly what Moscow wants. You know, yes, you're quite right. Moscow is stirring up the Ossetes and the Abkhaz uh, in order to block Georgian independence. Please do what the Balts are doing, or rather don't do what the Balts are not doing. Don't play that game. They played that game with the results that we're living with to this day. Um, and um, what now, I think an important thing here is, is the, um, in varying degrees, uh, the role of organized crime 
under Soviet rule. Um, of course, operating uh, in um, with various kinds of commodities, but of course the Caucasus, um, since it controlled a large part of an extremely value, what were in the Soviet grotesque communist economy, but also the monopolized economy, extremely valuable commodities on the black or gray market, alcohol, fruit, other things. Um, and what one saw in Georgia, unfortunately, with the collapse of Soviet rule, was for a time the ascendancy of armed nationalist militias, Khedrioni, for example, led by um, uh, Yoseliani, what was his first name? Can't remember. I interviewed him a number of times. I mean, basically, the merging of cr cr criminal groups and nationalist militias. And this had the most disastrous effect after the fall of Shevardnadze, when these nationalist militias invaded Abkhazia in the spring of uh, 1992 in order to overthrow the autonomous government of Abkhazia and prevent, it had also declared sovereignty, but once again, perhaps this could have been negotiated. <clears throat> they invaded, so, uh, of course, the Russian army, as later in the Donbass, sent in volunteers, uh, volunteers to fight for the Abkhaz. Incidentally, uh, the Chechens, Ch Chechen nationalists also volunteered. I first met Shamil Basayev uh, in Abkhazia, in Gudauta in 93, uh, commanding a, um, a, a Chechen volunteer unit. So the Abkhaz side uh, by 93 was a pretty mixed lot, um, but I, um, I, with colleagues, I, I did encounter an Abkhaz um, tank unit, uh, and um, they had uh, some of them uh, had uh, painted over, you know, painted the Abkhaz flag on it. Um, others probably didn't didn't know what the Abkhaz flag was, uh, and so some of them had simply um, tried to paint over the Russian markings with, with white paint. Others hadn't even bothered. This was a tank unit of the, you know, an armored unit of the Russian army, which had just been sent down there to win the war for the Abkhaz. Um, but once again, uh, it was actually the Georgian, these Georgian militias, uh, probably not under Shevardnadze's orders. They just did it for the sake of it. And also, of course, by the way, completely looted and largely burned. Uh, um, Suhum in the process, um, who you know launched this attack. So, the the role of organised crime and also linked with this, what has been called legal nihilism, coming out of Soviet rule. Um, uh, of course, the the cr the criminality of aspects of Soviet rule role of the KGB in general, but also the Soviet economy, which meant that so many basic and by the way, absolutely necessary things um, were illegal, strictly speaking, illegal. I mean, I, I, I broke the law on innumerable occasions. You had to, or you'd starve, you know, in, in, in the good old USSR. Um, now, in the case of the Baltic, this was counteracted by the influence of the European Union. Very important thing in Estonia, Estonia to some extent then gave, helped to give a colouring to the other two Baltic states, uh, was once again circumstance, contingency. Estonia is both close enough geographically and close enough linguistically to get and understand Finnish television. So um, throughout the, and you know, previously, of course, this was jammed and jammed, but in the later years of the Soviet Union, Soviets gave up to an extent, and anyway, everyone was busy, you know, evading the jam. So the, the last generation of Estonians grew up with access to a Western democratic media, which they could understand. And, and of course, others were listening to the BBC or VOA or whatever. It was a little bit different. This, in a certain sense, was, you know, the Estonians and the Finns are very close, they're sister nations. This was, in a certain sense, there, and it was television, you know, not just radio broadcasts. Um, this had a tremendous effect in shaping 
Baltic culture and counteracting the legal nihilism. Uh, you know, the, 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 the absolute contempt for law which existed uh, in varying degrees elsewhere. Now, uh, among the, the place where this contempt for law existed most of all, of all the places where I spent much time, was Chechnya, um, for a combination of reasons. Uh, the first, let's be candid, uh, it, it was the, the tradition of culturally sanctioned banditry. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, historically speaking, um, I'm half Irish. You know. Irish were absolutely notorious bandits until um, pretty late in history. And then, of course, it, uh, as in Chechnya, banditry took on uh, an eth a nationalist and ethno-religious caste because bandits and rebels, resistors against English rule merged, just as they did in the Caucasus. Um, the Abrek tradition became mixed up with resistance to Russian imperial conquest. So that was part of it. And, you know, deeply, deeply rooted in Chechen culture. Go, by the way, of course, going back long before the Russian conquest. Um, so I've been reading these Viking chronicles, same thing, these sagas. Um, spent a lot of time in Pakistan, Afghanistan, same thing in many areas, you know, um, cattle raiding especially. Um, interesting. Places I've mentioned, the, the desire is to steal your neighbor's cow. Um, there's a saying in Lithuanian, uh, which is has some of the same attitude, but with a different result, that every Lithuanian hopes that his neighbor's cow dies. So you have the strong element of envy of your neighbor, but you don't, you hope the cow dies, you don't want to steal it, which probably says something of profound cultural importance about both traditions, but I'll leave that for another day. But certainly cattle stealing, true of so many parts of the world, but bad for the modern state. Now, the second thing, of course, is the deportation uh, of 1944 to Central Asia. You know, when the whole of your po population has been uh, marched at gunpoint out of its own territory, deposited in the deserts and steppes of Central Asia, about a quarter of you die in the process. That does not, to put it mildly, encourage respect for the state or the law. So there is that. But then, um, as a result of these two elements, but also, of course, uh, as, you know, Sicily, southern Italy, kinship, and a language which nobody else speaks, which nobody else can understand, creates the absolutely perfect foundation for modern organized crime, for mafias, for omerta, as it's called, you know, by the Sicilian mafia, the code of silence, kinship, ethnicity, certainly kinship loyalty, and the Chechen gangs were, of course, very heavily also shaped by kinship, as you know, as in Sicily and southern Italy. Um, the Chechens came to play a tremendously important part in the world of Soviet organized crime. Um, again. Sicilians, the Union Corse, the Corsicans in French, the same combination of things in many ways. Uh, and uh, finally, um, there was, as a result of the deportation, there was the fact that uh, everywhere else, um, and this was in accordance with Soviet nationality policy as well as sort of Brezhnevite co option. Uh, <coughs> The communist leadership of um, but not just the Union Republics, but also of autonomous republics within Russia, had become led, dominated by the local ethnicity. Now, two jobs were always reserved for Russians, head of the KGB and second secretary. The second secretary was always a Russian um, who was there basically to keep an eye on what went on. But, of course, very often, they had very little idea what was going on. I, I talked, uh, my driver and interpreter uh, for several weeks was a former 
Chechen KGB officer who who talked you know fascinatingly uh, about how they were able to to just cover up so many things, disguise so many things, and their Russian superiors actually had no idea what was going on because they didn't know. Apart from anything else, they didn't know the Chechen language, they didn't know how can Chechen kinship worked. But there was a real problem, which was because of Russian distrust for the Chechens, the Chechens only took over the top reaches of the Chechen Auton Chechen Chechen Ingushetian Autonomous Republic in the late 1980s. That was when Doku Zavgayev, the first Chechen, became first secretary of the Chechen English Communist Party. That meant that unlike in Tatarstan, Dagestan, Kalmykia, wherever, they did not create these networks, these deeply rooted networks, they didn't have time to create these deeply rooted bureaucratic kinship networks, which meant that the roots of the Soviet state in Chechnya were much more shallow. Um, and this allowed in Chechnya, something which didn't happen anywhere else, in August 91, an actual revolution which destroyed, and here one is talking a little bit like, you know, the, the destruction of the Gaddafi state in uh, Gaddafi regime in Libya leads to the collapse of the Libyan state. The destruction of the Ba'ath regime in Iraq leads to the actual collapse of the state. The overthrow of the Communist Party in Chechnya in August 91, by the way, literally overthrown one case, they threw the Russian Central Secretary out of the window and killed him, um, led to the collapse, not just of communist rule, as in the Baltic or Armenia, but the actual collapse of the state itself. Georgia went with the overthrow of the Communist Party, went some distance down that road as well. So did Azerbaijan in 90 to 92. Um, but in Chechnya, the state as a whole collapsed. You had a, a theoretical formal ruler, um, Dudayev, Joko Dudayev, but in effect the entire structure of the state collapsed and was replaced by these this combination of nationalist militia, nationalist much more than Islamist at that stage, Islamism came later, and armed criminal. Uh, with, of course, disastrous effects already before the first war. Um, and then after the massive destruction, brutalization of the first war, absolutely catastrophic effects from 96 to 99, leading directly on to the second war. As a result of the second war, the Russians, Putin, uh, re-established a Chechen state based on hereditary kinship, the Kadyrov dynasty, which so far, through considerable ruthlessness, huge amount of Russian money, but also some very clever local politics, is holding things together in Chechnya. How long? We don't know. End of, end of talk, as usual, very happy to take questions. <laughs>